Juliet Brodsky, speaking with the Honourable Michael McHugh QC. Thank you very much for speaking with us for the New South Wales Bar Oral History. Oh, thank you for interviewing me. We have a lot to talk about over the next uh, couple of hours. But what I would like to do is um, I would like to talk a little bit about your earliest years because I know reading when you uh, were appointed to the High Court bench, you mentioned something of being sorry that your father wasn't there to see your ascension to such a, a high office. And I'm very interested to know about your growing up in Newcastle and a little bit about your father and mother in particular. Um, well, I was born in Newcastle, but we left um, Newcastle when I was seven to go to North Queensland um, from where my father came. And he worked in the mines at a place called Collinsville, which had about 600 people, no electricity and no running, running water. Um, so um, it was a very enjoyable period of, of my life. You had tremendous freedom. I spent uh, most of my time out of school on the back of a horse um, riding, riding around. Um, then uh, I, uh, I finished primary school. I think I was only the second child in probably the previous 20 years who got a secondary education. So I had to be sent to boarding school at, at the Charters Towers, which was a, a day journey by, tra by train. Um, but when I was 13, uh, we came back to Newcastle from where my mother, mother, mother came from. Um, my mother uh, was a highly intelligent woman uh, who was the secretary of a private company. Um, she lived to 100. She was still doing the books of the body corporate uh, at age uh, 95 or, or, or so. Um, and she was an ambitious woman. My father uh, was a very intelligent man, but uh, he was the... Uh, eldest child of a family of nine. His father died when he was 13 and he had to take his father's job in the mines when he was, when he was 13. So he had no um, opportunity for education. He was extremely well read. Uh, to the end of his days, he did that cryptic crossword in the Sydney Morning Herald uh, in a fairly short period, period of, of time. Um, but uh, when we were 13, as I say, we moved back to Newcastle. I went to Hamilton Mara's Brothers. Um, I, uh, we lived in a new suburb, but uh, the adjoining suburb was full of housing commission homes and uh, people from, with low incomes. Um, and uh, there was a, a cricket ground, sports ground, between the two suburbs and I used to meet a lot of boys from uh, Whitegates, which is the Housing Commission's suburb, and I was very interested in sport uh, and I got friendly with them. They all left school when they were 15. They were all earning money and I wanted to, to, to do it. So I leave school, uh, which upset my father particularly very much, and... Uh, um, in fact, there's a, I suppose you'd say some unpleasantness between us for several years as a, as a result of that. Uh, he used to say say to me, you'll, "You'll end up on the pick and shovel," which was what he <laughs> he had hoped I would I would avoid. So I worked at a variety of jobs. I worked as a in a sawmill. I worked as a uh, as a bread carter. I worked as a in the steelworks. Uh, I worked at a variety of jobs, and then uh, one day it suddenly dawned on me. I think principally because of my sister, who had just done the leaving certificate, and who was just to start at uh, Newcastle. It wasn't a university in those days. It was a university college attached to the University of New South Wales, and she just started there. And I thought to myself, when I better do something, and so uh, I didn't even have a leaving certificate, so I enrolled at Hamilton Evening College, and 
uh, it was probably about March or so, I think, and uh, but I, I managed to um, matriculate at the end of the year. Uh, there was no law school in Newcastle. Um, the alternative was to come to um, Sydney and go to the university down here uh, for four years. It would probably have to be five years because it'd be a, I'd have had to keep myself down here. So I elected to stay in Newcastle and do the Barristers Admission Board course, which theoretically could be done in two years. Um, and I'd, I would hope to do it in that, but I was working uh, at the time as a clerk at the BHP and it took me th three years to, f to finish it. So, uh, But there were no lectures. They sent you uh, uh, books to read. There were law school lecture notes which you got a copy of and then you presented yourself for an exam every three months on any subject that you wanted to, to sit for and ultimately I, I passed. Um, so really I was going to ask yeah. you at that, at that point, the flavour I'm getting of your life up until that time was you, yours was really an introduction to law through the school of life. <laughs> yes, I think, you, I think you could say that. But I'd always been interested in, in becoming a barrister um, I learned to read quite early and um, in North Queensland uh, uh, as a probably a seven or eight year old I used to read uh, um, uh, reports of trials which in those days were um, reported very much um, verbatim. Um, you mean the exchanges? Well, cross-examination of witnesses, witnesses and so on. And that was the case here in, in New South Wales when the evening papers were, were, were running as, as well. They'd go through five or six editions. Uh, and people of, in a fascinating trial, uh, like the trial of Fleming charged with poisoning his wife, uh, people would buy three or four editions just to find out what the, what the evidence, evidence was. But anyway, I read all those cases and, and I knew about W.R. Dovey KC and D.W. Shank KC back in those days when I was eight or nine years of age. Eight or nine? Yes. Um, so, well, there was nothing else to do in Collinsville except read books or ride horses or play a bit of sport. Uh, uh, the school I went to, I went to Collinsville Convent School, which was a one-room school a bit longer than this room, uh, with two um, blackboard petitions dividing off, off, the, off the classes. And in, in fact, you'd have two classes uh, in, in one section. So that was... Uh, uh, so uh, I read... Uh, I think I've, I must have read hundreds of books in the... the they had a library in Collinsville. And uh, I read... Uh, and, oh, not, maybe hundreds is an exaggeration, but certainly it would have been over a over hundred. So really you were an autodidact, <laughs> which is very unusual. I mean, I've, I'm get, I've, I, have, I have to ask you this because I'm so interested. You, you ostensibly came from a very much an industrial, almost working-class type of background, but you spoke about your parents being highly intelligent and uh, valuing the education, the importance of an education. You couldn't help yourself, could you? <laughs> no, no, I couldn't. Uh, but anyway... Um, Putting such a value, I mean, on reading and... Yes. Uh, well, my father was a keen reader um, and so was, so was my, my mother. And although these days, I regret to say, I, I find it very difficult to read fiction, uh, up to about the age of 25, I think I'd read most fiction that was worth reading up to, up to, up to that, that time. Uh, when I was in Cuba a few years ago... Uh, I was taking out to Hemingway's house. Um, the guide around, uh, who took me around was astonished at my recollection of all the Hemingway novels and all the characters <laughs> and discussing them with her. But, so I, I read very, very widely in, in, uh, in uh, many spheres, uh, fiction, history, Biography and uh, about the law. There was what was called what is called the Notable British Trial Series. Uh, I, I think I read most of those trials uh, at different uh, different different stages. 